back into session now. So uh, next on the agenda is 2213080 Ontario Corporation and Russell Rosso Falls Estates Limited and Mr. Sharp, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Okay. The next applications to be heard are consent applications B slash 10 through 14 slash 19 slash ML and zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 15 slash 19 in the names of 2213080 Ontario Corporation and Rosso Falls Estates Limited. One of the three parcels comprising the subject lands is known municipally as 1246 Purdy Road, unit number eight. The remaining parcels have not been assigned a civic address. The purpose and effect of the applications is as follows. Severance applications along with a zoning amendment application have been submitted to reconfigure lot lines and grant rights of way. An existing right of way is to be abandoned. No new additional lots are being created. In the first and second application, being applications B slash 10 slash 11 slash 19 slash ML, the applicant being 2213080 Ontario Corporation proposes to sever their property and add it to two abutting lots along with rights of way. The severed lots are vacant and no changes are proposed at this time. The retained lot will contain an existing dwelling and boathouse. No changes are proposed at this time. The right of way is in favor of the resultant lots. In the third application being application B slash 12 slash 19 slash ML, the applicant being Rosso Falls Estates Limited proposes to sever their property and add it to an abutting lot along with a grant of right-of-way. The severed and retained lots are vacant. No changes are proposed at this time. The right-of-way is in favor of the resultant lot. In the fourth application, being application B slash 13 slash 19 slash ML, the applicant being 2213080 Ontario Corporation proposes to grant a right-of-way in favor of the retained lot in application B slash 12 slash 19 slash ML. In the fifth application, being application B slash 14 slash 19 slash ML, the applicant being Rosso Falls Estates Limited proposes to sever their property and add it to an abutting lot. The severed and retained lots are vacant and no changes are proposed at this time. The purpose of the bylaw being bylaw 2019-71 is to rezone portions of the subject lands and provide an exemption to bylaw 2014-137. The severed lots and applications B slash 10 through 12 slash 19 slash ML are to be rezoned from open space OS2 to waterfront residential WR1-7. A portion of the retained lot and application B slash 14 slash 19 slash ML is to be rezoned from open space OS2 to waterfront residential WR5-7. The purpose of this bylaw is to provide an exemption, is also to provide an exemption from section 1, subsection 3 of zoning bylaw 2014-137 being the minimum lot frontage and lot area requirements on the, subject, on the subject lands. Bylaw 2014-137 imposed minimum lot frontages and lot areas for each of the existing lots which recognized existing lot configurations and restricted any future land division. Bylaw 2019-71 proposes to recognize the new lot dimensions and this will restrict any future land division. This bylaw, being bylaw 2019-71, will have the effect of rezoning the proposed severed lots and a portion of a retained lot and of providing an exemption to the minimum lot frontages and lot areas to allow a reconfiguration of lot lines. Notice of this public Meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and five submissions have been received to date. The first submission is by the District Municipality of Muskoka, Planning and Economic Development Department. Cassidy Fior, District Planner, advises that the district has no objection and requests to be notified. The second submission is by Sandy Boss, Township Building Inspector, regarding servicing. And Mr. Boss has no comment regarding the applications and recommends that the applications be appro approved from a servicing standpoint. The third submission is by Neil Donald, the township's chief building official, and the, build, the building department has no Ontario building code objections. The fourth submission is by Ken Becking, the township's director of public works, and the submission reads as follows. The properties will be accessed by Purdy Road. Purdy Road is a gravel surface road, which is substandard. Upgrades to the road should be anticipated as a result of the increased activity on the road and that is again signed by Ken Becking, the township's director of public works. 
The fifth submission is by Douglas Holland, the Township's Fire Prevention Officer and Emergency Management Coordinator, and the Emergency Services Department has no objections. Staff have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of the applications, staff have recommended a number of standard conditions of consent. Staff have also recommended two minor amendments to bylaw 2019-71. The first is to repeal part of bylaw 2014-137, which froze the subject lands in the present configurations to restrict lot creation. New lot configurations are now proposed and bylaw 2019-71 will reflect the new configurations and restrict lot creation. The second is to prohibit agricultural uses, a forestry operation in Wayside Pit and Quarry on the resultant lot in application B-14-19-ML. slash 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 the township's comprehensive zoning bylaw will otherwise permit these uses within the open space private OS2 zone portions of this lot. And township official plan policy directs that these uses are restricted at the interface between the rural and waterfront designations. Staff have no further comments at this time and are happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Any questions? Any? Uh, Back to this, sorry. Um, is there someone here speaking on behalf of this application? Thank you. Just your, your name and address, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Nick Popovich. I'm here with Helena Kramer, uh, C-R-A-Y-M-E-R. -E We're both with Marie Poirier Planning and Associates, 2866 Highway 60 in Dwight, Ontario, POA 1HO. And uh, we're the agents for the applicants. I think the key thing to re remember about this, this series of applications is that we're proposing four lot additions and two rights of way. There are no new lots being created, just lot reconfigurations and the new rights of way. So you're not going to see any new development other than new road uh, relocate being relocated. The uh, rezonings are to uh, avoid split zoning of the property because we are trying to just have one consistent zone on each of these resultant lots. So you'll see some of the proposed lots have a um, open space zone in the back and to the east. Those will be rezoned to the waterfront residential zone so that they're all consistent. All of the resultant lots will exceed the minimum lot frontage and area requirements of the zoning bylaw. I should note that in the past, in 2013, there was an EIS prepared by Beacon Environmental and that uh, environmental analysis showed that there were no concerns on these properties. There was also an archaeological study done in 2013 that showed no uh, concerns with these development on these properties. Uh, to summarize, we concur with the recommendations set out in the staff report and as highlighted by Mr. Sharp. We have no concerns with any of the uh, minor amendments that have been proposed and are happy to answer any questions. Um, I will note that Helena has uh, prepared the applications and I'm here to support but we can both answer questions that uh, any questions that arise hopefully thank you thank you anyone else here in support of the application yes. I'm on lot 1246 two and I share the second lot four with mr. Lustig and I have no problems with the, in support of this. Uh, could you, you just, your I name, just please? Your name Kimmel, and address? A O M I, Himmel, H I M A L. All right, the address. Uh, 1246, lot two. And mine is everyone last year, 20 Strathern Boulevard, Toronto, Ontario, M5B, 2R7. And I just want to make sure that my right of way to my road is not removed until the purchase of sale is, is goes through. That's about the only thing. That's the only thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else here to speak for this? Okay. Opposing it. Hi, my name is Ann Purdy. I live at 1218 Purdy Road, uh, Winter Repeal B1PO. It is a great concern to me. I am a recent two-year permanent residence, having cottaged here for, oh, over 35 years. Um, just a little bit of uh, reason for my concern. Um, Pretty Road is a seasonable road, seasonal road, not looked after by the township, as you perhaps all know. 
uh, any more traffic, any more building sites, any anything com uh, you know, impacting the road is crucial. The road is in horrible condition. Uh, the word from uh, township is that they don't have enough money to do the road, although there are a number of there's nine cottages on the road now. Um, <clears throat> another concern of mine and four of our cottages is that there's not any transparency. We have not, other than getting this 20 days ago, we had not heard a thing about this. And that's a substantial amount of work that's been done on these maps and whatever. We would like to have the courtesy to know uh, because three years ago, Mr. O'Brien, who owns the property, put in another road off Purdy Road, which is huge. And it involved uh, blasting and trucks and everything. And to put a cottage, a huge cottage has been built on that road. And there's several other lots that you see at the bottom there um, that were created. Um, none of them have existing buildings on them. I believe two of them have been sold. Um, but it is a concern because we, we are not um, been made aware of all these plans, and we would like to be included. Not that we will necessarily oppose it, but we'd like to know what's going on, especially me, because I live there. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Anyone else prefer to speak <laughs> against this? Okay, questions, comments from anyone on council? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the Purdy Road, how many um, properties are there who, who would gain that, use at Purdy Road? Nine cottages uh, have access to Purdy Road now. Nine cottages, how many vacant lots? Uh, well, one, two, six on six, this property, nine, and yeah, six. Okay, uh, the only reason I bring that up, I heard the uh, concern about the uh, access on the road. Um, and and uh, there is a tendency for seasonal growth. So, um, and I, I'm on a, uh, on a road that we maintain, and there's, there's definitely have to be some sort of attention to that um, because it's not township maintained. It's probably uh, township not maintained property. No, but isn't I have to have a cloud several of us? Yeah, so that, that's a concern. Um, so the, so the, the, que the, the second question I have, the final question, is to staff so we've, we've developed these four new property lines um, and so I anticipate that in the near future we'll be receiving a, a request to build on those uh, no, there's, no building. there's no building now no, no. so what I'm what yeah. So what my question is, what will we face in the future if, if, if they were building applications, would there have to be um, amendments to the, the bylaws for people to build, or, or can they be built? Yes, uh, Mr. Sure. You, Madam Chair. Um, just in response to that question, I think it's important to realize that there are three existing land parcels today, and there will be three parcels of land if um, if committee recommends approval of this application. One of the three parcels involved is currently developed. Two are vacant with development rights today. They could be developed as of right today. So no new lots are being created through this application. Frontages aren't changing. Um, so I think it's important to, uh, to recognize the fact that the lots as it, uh, the vacant lots as they exist today could be developed with a dwelling and associated accessory structures as of right. Just got, they could be developed. I don't fully understand that, but there would, would there have to be any amendments to allow them to develop a the, the lot size is fine, the waterfront is fine, perfect. Yep, there would be uh, you know if they're developing in compliance with the township's zoning bylaw, there would be no uh, amendments required. Councillor Nishikawa, I recall. Um, in staff's report that um, our director of public works had concerns about the road um, and I just want to confirm that um, whether this is a seasonal ma maintained road and or the understanding of all property owners that um, whatever road issues they would be 
a private matter, not a matter of the township. I'm just asking to that, have that confirmed. I can try to uh, help through the chair. Um, the, I think uh, just so that everyone's clear, uh, Pretty Road, uh, I believe, follows roughly this configuration. That's a seasonally maintained township road. It then becomes private at this location. And the application before you is essentially to take these backlands and make these waterfront lots, existing developed waterfront lots, larger. And the right-of-way currently follows relatively close to the lake, and the right-of-way will be relocated back there. That is a private road. And I believe also we heard in the presentations uh, the previous private road that was put in. These lots were created about, uh, I'm going to guess, about four or five years ago through an extensive process, and the new private road was built <coughs> down here and along there to access them. So as we heard from Mr. Sharp, all that's proposed is a reconfiguration of lot lines to add lands to the um, uh, existing waterfront lots uh, at the rear uh, and relocate the right-of-way. Uh, you're correct to answer the question. The private road <coughs> uh, road maintenance matters and discussions are a private matter, uh, but Purdy Road is a seasonally maintained uh, township road, and I believe um, some of the comments we made have heard were concerns about its, its status, and that would be under municipal authority. Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes, uh, uh, through you to, to staff. Uh, David, I wonder if you could point out where the, the individual that uh, said she wanted to have notice, where is her property? Is it on this map? I believe uh, she may be best to confirm, but I believe you may own roughly this property then. So, so I'm on the seasonal road. Okay, so it's on the seasonal road. Thank you. Mayor Hardy. Thank you. Um, just a question, Stephen. It, you know, it seems to me they would just want to make a little bit bigger lot. Um, roughly right now, the depth of their lot. Appreciate the waterfront, but the expansion portion of it, um, we allow 10% in the front 200 feet. I'm assuming each lot is currently at least roughly 200 feet long, so any additional development. So there's no new cottages being proposed. They can't build necessarily a bigger cottage in the front lot, but they could potentially add a garage in the back lot at the end of this lot addition. So I'm not sure why our public works would talk about increased traffic and increased building. <clears throat> there's no new lots, no new people per lot happening. Um, so, I mean, I guess there's construction traffic, but they repair the road anyway that we do. So, um, I, I'm in favor of this. Councillor Edwards? Um, I'm also in favor of it. it is, it's actually lot additions. Um, was this, uh, did this go to L LPAT, was it, this, this application? No, this, the application before you has not been to LPAT. I believe there was a uh, former OMB process associated with the, oh, it was uh, the former other, lot creations, yeah, it was but, the lot, yeah. but not so with respect to this application. So these weren't frozen by the OMB then? There's a current bylaw in the books that freezes the lots in the current configurations. Mm -hmm. I think this per, through, through this process, and that's the minor amendment that staff is recommending, is that that portion of the bylaw that's on the books today that it be repealed and then a new um, uh, the new uh, lot configurations um, be uh, frozen through this bylaw that's before committee mm -hmm. okay so actually what we're saying is they were originally frozen now they're being thawed to make them a little bit different Summertime. <laughs> because nothing is forever it seems so uh, I again because they're larger lots I don't have a problem with this and I would support it I will read this first, second, and third time. I'm in learning just, curve here, guys. So, so it's not the bylaw. It's, it's, not, the it's just, just this? Okay. So be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Council that bylaw 20. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that the Planning Committee recommend to Council that bylaw 2019-71 and zoning bylaw amendment ZBA-1519B 
be approved with minor amendments to repeal Section 1, Subsection 3 of Bylaw 2014-137 and to prohibit agricultural uses of forestry operation and wayside pit and quarry on resultant lot D in application B slash 14 slash 19 slash ML. And that consent applications B slash 10 slash 14 slash 19 slash ML 2213080 Ontario Corp and Rosso Falls Estates Limited be approved subject to the following conditions. One that register, registerable uh, descriptions, deeds, of the severed lots along with any required rights of way be submitted to the Secretary Treasurer of the Committee of Adjustment along with a registered copy of the reference plan. Two, that a legal undertaking be submitted in order to confirm that each severed lot will merge in title to the lots they are being added to upon registration of the transfer de um, slash deed, which may include breaking consent that a zoning bylaw amendment be approved to grant an exemption for minimum lot requirements in bylaw 2014-137 and to recognize the resultant lot dimensions. Four, that a zoning bylaw amendment be approved to rezone the severed lots, severed lots A, B, and C in applications B slash 10 slash 11 slash 12 slash 19 slash uh, ML from open space uh, private OS2 to Waterfront Residential WR1-75, that a zoning bylaw amendment be approved to rezone a portion of the retained lot, retained lot B, in application B slash 14 slash 19 slash ML from open space private OS2 to Waterfront Residential WR5-7. Oh, I'm not quite finished. <coughs> Six, that a zoning bylaw amendment be approved to repeal section one, subsection three of bylaw 2014-137. That a zoning bylaw amendment be approved that prohibits agricultural uses, a forestry operation, and wayside pit and quarry on the resultant lot, resultant lot D, in application B slash 14 slash 19 slash ML. Any comments? Any? So can I call and all those in favor? Any opposed? It carries. So next on the agenda is um, is uh, the Eden property, and I'm going to ask Mr. Sharp again for explanation, please. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. The next applications to be heard are consent applications B slash 18 slash 19 slash 19 slash ML and zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA dash 18 slash 19 in the name of Eden at 3 and 4 Island Tondern, unit numbers M69A. The applications have been submitted concurrently. The purpose and effect of the applications is as follows. A technical severance application along with a zoning amendment application have been submitted to recreate two lots. Firstly, the proposed severance applications being applications B slash 18 slash 19 slash 19 slash ML proposed to recreate two lots. The subject lands were at one time two separate lots which upon a recent purchase inadvertently merged. The subject lots are vacant and no changes are proposed at this time. Secondly, the zoning amendment application being application ZBA-18-19 proposes to provide an exemption from section 4.1.3 of bylaw 2014-14 as amended being the minimum, minimum lot frontage and lot area requirements in a waterfront residential WR5-7 zone. The minimum lot frontage requirement is 300 feet and the minimum lot area requirement is 1.5 acres. The proposed lots are to have the following sizes. The severed lot in application B slash 18 slash 19 slash ML is to have 220 feet of lot frontage and 1.04 acres of lot area. 
sev the severed lot in application B slash 19 slash 19 slash ML is to have 195 feet of lot frontage and 1.29 acres of lot area. Please note the measurements regarding lot frontage and lot area have been reduced in bylaw 2019-81. Reducing the measurements will ensure conformity with the bylaw once the new survey has been prepared or confirmed by an Ontario land surveyor. It is anticipated that a new survey or confirmation will show greater amounts. In summary, bylaw 2019-81 will have the effect of recreating two lots with undersized fr lot frontages and lot areas. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20 days in advance and five submissions have been received to date. The first submission is by the District Municipality of Muskoka Planning and Economic Development Department and Cassidy Fior, District Planner, advises that the district has no objection or, and requests to be notified. The second submission is by Sandy Boss, Township Building Inspector, regarding servicing, and the submission is as follows. In regard to uh, the severed lot in application B slash 18 slash 19 slash ML, Mr. Boss notes that areas suitable for on-site sewage disposal are marginal on the lot. In regard to the severed lot in application B slash 19 slash 19 slash ML, Mr. Boss notes that areas suitable for on-site sewage disposal exist along plateau areas on the lot. However, the sewage system locations may interfere with the proposed development sites. Mr. Boss recommends that the applications be approved um, subject to a condition. Mr. Boss notes that due to the marginal or limited suitable areas for on-site sewage disposal, a development plan is requested outlining building sites, access, septic areas, etc. And again, that's signed by Sandy Boss, Township Building Inspector. The third submission is by Neil Donald, the Township's Chief Building Official, and the Building Department has no Ontario Building Code objections. The fourth submission is by Ken Becking, the Township's Director of Public Works, and the Public Works Department has no comments. The fifth submission is by Douglas Holland, the Township's Fire Prevention Officer and Emergency Management Coordinator. The Emergency Services Department has no objections. Staff have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. If committee is considering recommending approval of the applications, staff have recommended a number of standard conditions of consent, including a condition related to confirmation of servicing requirements as per Mr. Boss's recommendation. Staff have no further comments at this time and are happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Is there anyone here speaking on behalf of the applicant? Thank you. That's good afternoon, uh, Chair Bridgman and uh, members of committee. Uh, Stephen Fawner, Northern Vision Planning Limited. 109 Meadow Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. I'm here representing uh, Mark Eden, the uh, owner of the property, and uh, his wife uh, Caroline is present uh, today to uh, listen in. Uh, as mentioned, it is a recreation of two pre-existing lots, and I would like to thank staff for their positive report. I think as usual, I have my dog and pony show, uh, and uh, hopefully we can get through that uh, fairly quickly. Um, in terms of the planning framework, there's really no specific policy in the local official plan regarding the recreation of lots. You almost have to defer to the district official plan. And a couple of key things there is that uh, there's evidence of the inadvertent merger, which there has been. We have submitted a, a legal letter from a lawyer involved with the transaction, and uh, uh, yes, it was uh, an accidental merger. And uh, there's to be no further impairment of water quality. And um, the township actually allows for the recreation of lots if there's two uses on the property, if they happen to be built on. In fact, the criteria that you would use would be the existing lot of record criteria of 100 feet of frontage and 15,000 square feet. But of course, these properties are vacant. Uh, these merged very recently in 2018, and this is, as mentioned, a, is a technical severance. So there's the lot sizes, and I believe that Bryce had indicated uh, what those sizes were as well. And there's the overall plan, the old plan uh, 35R3100, uh, and we're looking at uh, parts uh, five and six are the two. And I think the next one shows a blow up of those two lots. Yeah, and those are the two lots there. And in terms of the site, I guess with the lighting in here, it's a little tough to tell, but this is the westerly lot uh, near the uh, water's edge. So it's uh, it's actually in a bit of a bowl shape. It rises up to the left there, and it also rises sort of in behind where this picture is taken from. But it's a very viable lot. This is the westerly severed lot. 
And this is again on the westerly severed lot looking out towards the water, uh, good tree cover, uh, good shoreline buffer. And this is actually towards the back of the lot looking up uh, back towards, this is actually access through Omar's golf course by a cart path. So you take a golf cart to get to the property. And there's the golf cart in the background actually. This is the uh, back of the uh, property too. And there, there are septic locations. Mr. Boss has indicated that it is tight, but there are septic locations. This is uh, looking up to the neighbor to the west, again a bit of a bowl, and you can see that the neighbor is uh, on a rise above the subject lands. This is uh, moving to the easterly severed lot. This is right at the uh, northwest corner, and there is obviously rock outcropping, almost a cliff in that location, but this is very isolated. This is uh, above on the flatland, looking out towards the water. And again, this is on the flatland uh, above that area. It actually gets, the slope is, is less steep off to your right. And in fact, that's where uh, Colson Brothers have indicated they would uh, set up a barge to access this property would be up off the easterly lot line there, and, that, and it's very doable. And this is back in behind, and uh, again, very level land. Uh, this is getting back towards the cart path. And this is just a profile shot across that. Uh, there are some slopes there, but they're not insurmountable. So in terms of planning analysis, they, again, they inadvertently merged, and there is a lawyer letter to that effect. And I did speak about if there was a development on there, and there is a current zoning bylaw exemption application. Steep slopes are very isolated on lot two, and that steep area is about 50 feet from the shoreline. I put this in, I know it's hard to see, but there are contours on there, and you can see that And the lot sizes proposed are similar to those in the area. And there has been a change in the Planning Act uh, so that properties don't merge. Uh, but of course, these were properties that were created prior to 1979, so you put them in the same name. Unfortunately, they merge. So in conclusion, uh, I feel that this is good, uh, makes good planning sense. Uh, spring of last year, these were two separate lots. I have in my file, I've got two separate tax bills. I have the parcel register as so there's two separate parcel registers. It shows two separate lots. And unfortunately, they inadvertently mer merged. Uh, there are building sites and septic sites on these properties, a little, a little bit uh, tight. It is subject to site plan control because it is dash seven. So there will be certain site plan requirements. So thank you very much. I'm here to answer any questions. Is there anyone here who would like to speak against this application? Oh, is there anybody else in support of this application? <laughs> you would be the owner, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, you may get some questions. You might not. Okay. All right. Anybody, council? Any questions, comments? No? Oh. Councilor? And that's just a comment. It is just uh, actually putting two lots back that were legal lots, and I don't have a problem with it. I would support it. Anyone else? All right. I will read the motion then. Moved by Councilor Edwards, seconded by Councilor Roberts. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Council that Bylaw 2019 81 and Zoning Bylaw Amendment. Said B A 18 slash 19 be approved, and that consent applications B slash 18 slash 19 slash 19 slash ML Eden be approved subject to the following conditions that a registrable description of each severed lot um, with any required right of way be submitted to the Secretary Treasurer of the Committee of Adjustment along with a registered copy of the reference plan. To confirmation that the township is satisfied that each severed lot is satisfactory for on-site sewage disposal and that any problems identified with any existing sewage system be corrected to the satisfaction of the township. Three, that a zoning bylaw amendment be approved for exemptions from waterfront residential WR 5-7 minimum lot requirements. Any comments? Any discussion? Okay, I'll put it to the vote. Those for? Those against? Okay, motion carries.
Okay, our, our next one is uh, the Newlands property, and I'm going to call on Mr. Allen for this, please. Thank you. This is a public meeting for Zoning Bylaw Amendment 1319, Bylaw 2019-55, in the name of Newlands. The lands are known municipally as 2-1124 Island Park Road and are presently in the ownership of William Newlands. A dwelling two-story boathouse with sleeping cabin above, an onshore sleeping cabin, sun decks and a dock are presently located on the property. The applicant proposes to enlarge the existing dwelling and attach sun deck, enlarge the existing two-story boathouse, enlarge the dock associated with the boathouse and reconfigure the onshore sleeping cabin. The purpose of this bylaw is to provide an exemption to sections 32A and 32E of bylaw 2014, which prohibits an increase in the floor area of a dwelling on a lot containing more than one sleeping cabin and prohibits the relocation or change of the dimensions of legal non-compliant buildings. The applicant proposes to expand and increase the floor area of the existing dwelling, reconfigure the sleeping cabin located on the second story of the boathouse and reconfigure the onshore sleeping cabin on a lot that contains two sleeping cabins. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to sections 413 and 4135 of bylaw 2014 being the minimum permitted front yard setback of the existing dwelling set back to a minimum of 50 feet. The existing dwelling has a front yard setback of 13 feet and the minimum front yard setback therefore is 50 feet. The applicant proposes to permit additions to the dwelling with front yard setbacks of 20.6 feet and 13.2 feet. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to section 413 of bylaw 2014 being the minimum permitted interior side yard setback of 15 feet. The applicant proposes to permit an addition to a dwelling with a side yard setback of 13.3 feet. The existing dwelling has a side yard setback of 14.1 feet. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to sections 413 and 4135 of bylaw 2014 being the minimum permitted front yard setback of the existing sun deck set back to a minimum of 40 feet. The existing sun deck has a front yard setback of 1.3 feet and therefore the minimum front yard setback of the sun deck is 40 feet. The applicant proposes to permit an addition to a sun deck with a front yard setback of 19 feet. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to section 4162 of bylaw 2014 being the maximum permitted floor area of a sleeping cabin of 650 square feet. The applicant proposes to permit the reconfiguration of a sleeping cabin with a floor area of 812 square feet. Please note that the existing sleeping cabin floor area is 831 square feet. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to section 413 and 4135 of bylaw 2014 being the minimum permitted front yard setback of the existing sleeping cabin set back to a minimum of 50 feet. The existing sleeping cabin has a front yard setback of 16 feet and therefore the minimum front yard setback is 50 feet. The applicant proposes to reconfigure the existing sleeping cabin with a front yard setback of 18.7 feet. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to sections 417 and 41712 of bylaw 2014 being the maximum permitted cumulative dock width on a category 1 lake, Lake Rosso, of 25% of the frontage up to a maximum of 75 feet. The applicant proposes to widen the dock associated with the boathouse by 15.6 feet resulting in a cumulative dock width of 141.7 feet. This bylaw will have the effect of permitting the expansion of a dwelling on a lot where more than one, where more than one sleeping cabin exists permitting the reconfiguration of two sleeping cabins where two sleeping cabins exist, permitting additions to a dwelling with a front yard setback of 20.6 feet and 13.2 feet, permitting an addition to a dwelling with a side yard setback of 13.3 feet, permitting addition to a sun deck with a front yard setback of 19 feet, permitting the reconfiguration of a sleeping cabin with 812 square feet of floor area, permitting the reconfiguration of a sleeping cabin with a front yard setback of 18.7 feet and permitting a cumulative dock width of 141.7 feet. We've received no comments from the public related to this application, but we have received comments from the District of Muskoka. Uh, the District uh, Planning and Economic Development Department has no objection to this application. Uh, we've also received comments from the Development Services Department, Public Works Department and Emergency Services Department of the Township Muskoka Lakes and they have no objection to this application. I would direct your attention to page uh, 371 of the agenda package for the site plan. Uh, there's also an extensive number of elevations and floor plans and surveys included in your agenda package, as well as a detailed staff report providing pictures um, of the property itself. 
staff would be happy to any, answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, is there anyone here speaking in favor of this application? Thank you. Good uh, afternoon. Um, no, I was here in the morning at one point, but uh, yeah, it took a little while to get to this point. Uh, my name is Savas Ferratis of Plan Muskoka. I'm here this, uh, this afternoon to represent the applicants as their agent and as a professional planner. Um, I'll try to keep this presentation pretty brief. Uh, I know I, I have allotted five minutes to work with here, so I'm sure everybody kind of wants to get this day over with. So um, I first state that I've read the planning uh, report that was written by staff, and I concur with their uh, opinion and their, uh, their recommendation for the approval of this application. Really, when I met with staff originally, uh, we were looking at three minor changes to three existing structures on this property. And we sort of debated whether or not each one should go forward as a separate minor variance application or should we dealt with uh, comprehensively all at once. And the decision was made that we should be dealing with, the, with this all at once just to lay it all out and make sure that uh, everything was taken care of. So I'll just work from left to right, I guess you could say, across this uh, site plan that you see here on the board and um, sort of describe very briefly what is being proposed because the numbers on paper sound fairly confusing. I, got, like, I, I had a hard time following exactly what was going on and I know what's going on. So, um, f Firstly, the dwelling as you see on the left side of this property sort of is positioned in this little peninsula of land that sticks out on, on the property. Um, it's located fairly close to the shoreline. It's a legal non-complying structure that was you know, in existence predating the bylaw. Um, the addition that's proposed is to the very far rear of the, of the, of the structure as you see in sort of shaded in gray, kind of, kind of coming on the back of that property. It's located primarily on top of an existing sun deck that's in that location. And it's a two-story addition um, to this dwelling. But it's, it's fairly minor in size, under 400 square feet in size. It's located as far as you could locate anything somewhere from the water uh, on this building. And still, because of the way the shoreline wraps around the structure, still results in um, setback variances required uh, from the uh, zoning bylaw. In terms of... Um, you know, visual impacts because it's located at the rear of the structure. Uh, you're going to see very little of this addition actually when viewed from from the lake, and um, there is some vegetation in and around the structure itself that helps buffer that from view as well. Um, as you move across the shoreline, the next structure you see, um, sort of rectangular shaped, is a sleeping cabin, and it's located more or less right on top of where the existing sleeping cabin is. Um, if if you followed what, what Ryan was saying, the existing sleeping cabin is 831 square feet in floor area. The proposed sleeping cabin is a slight reduction on that, 812 square feet. And it's located slightly further back from the water than the, the existing structure is as well. That structure is extremely well hidden from view. Um, when you look at the property from the lake, there's a very thick, mature natural buffer located all the way around the whole structure that uh, buffers it from view. There really isn't much of a change proposed other than the shape of the building, but as Ryan had, a, had already uh, explained in his presentation, any time when there's two sleeping cabins on a property, uh, any change, uh, whether it would have normally complied to the bylaw or not, to a non-complying structure um, would trigger the need for a Planning Act approval. That's why we're here then today for that. Um, and then moving along, there is an existing two-slip, two-story boathouse on the property located on the far east side. Um, the intent is to reconstruct that building and, and also add a third slip. The structure itself uh, in the staff report cites this as well, would actually comply to the zoning bylaw on its own. Uh, it, it, it's well under the maximum projection permitted for both the boathouse and the dock. It's under the maximum width permitted on, on a property if it was sitting by itself there. Um, the structure itself is, um, I, I guess, in comparison to what we see on these big lakes, fairly modest in size, uh, even at the, with the additional slip. And the additional slip adds a 15.6 feet of width to that structure. So the only width change or addition that's being proposed is 15.6 feet of additional width. So, but when you look at the number, 192, I believe, is what staff came to? 0.7, 192.7. This is, to me, very misleading, I guess, for this property because realistically there's one dock, as you see, sticking out the front there, uh, and there's uh, an existing boathouse that's being widened by 15 feet to a total of 58.8 feet in width. So where's that 192 coming from? Um, first of all, if you look at the way the dock is, is, is designed, that kink in the dock, that, that, that dock is only 10 feet wide. 
but that kink in the dock actually measures it to be 43.5 feet wide, sim simply because of the way the zoning bylaw defines the weight width is measured in, uh, in, in by the bylaw. So, w would its impact be 43.5 feet? Probably not. Um, I think most people would see that as a 10 foot wide dock when they come by. Then, as you move into the shoreline, there's a little cove, and it's really shallow waters in that cove. I would say, right at the shoreline, about 18 inches deep, maybe not even. Um, there's a boardwalk that um, historically had existed there. Um, the photographs you've probably seen your, in the staff report look like it's newer. It's, I think it's been resurfaced um, fairly recently. But that boardwalk, uh, because it exists right up to the shoreline and extending over the shoreline, um, the way that the zoning bylaw defines what a shoreline structure would be, would be anything where the, uh, the projection of it comes out over the water in a dock or a vessel, I guess you could say, would be able to be docked to it. So from a technical standpoint, this boardwalk is considered a dock. And as a, as a, as a result of that, um, its entire width is calculated towards between lift width as well. Now, is it intended to be used as a dock? Absolutely not. And I would say you'd have a hard time putting anything more than a kayak or a canoe up beside that, uh, given how shallow the waters are. But because of that, it contributes towards community width in this property and um, results in what I feel is a fairly you know, exaggerated number for, uh, for what we're dealing with. To me, the only two true structures that contribute towards width is that boathouse and that dock on the, on the tip of the, the, the land over there. If you were to look at that dock as a 10-foot dock, and if you were to look at that boathouse as the 58.8 .8 feet wide that it actually is, the result would be about 69 feet of width of actual docking structure, which would actually comply with the zoning bylaw. But because of the way the bylaw defines structures and the way that they're oriented towards the shoreline, you result in 192, so it's uh, quite a bit different. I still feel the shoreline structure width meets the intent of the official plan for this application, despite the fact that that number is uh, extremely large uh, on paper. But uh, looking, at this, looking at it from an intent of the official plan and how shoreline structures should be measured and built on a property, I believe it still meets the intent of the, uh, of the zoning bylaw. And I guess one last thing to mention is um, the property as a, as a whole has the potential, the frontage in the area, to be severed to two separate properties. Two separate properties on this, um, from this property could result in two dwellings, two sleeping cabins, two shoreline structures, one on each lot. Um, and uh, as a result, would would have 20% lot coverage because 10 and 10 added together. This property as a whole, even with the proposed additions that are uh, that are being made, falls under 5% lot coverage. So you can see that the actual build out of these lands is quite a bit less than what the zoning bylaw would normally permit. Um, that lends itself to the um, the argument of whether or not this property will be overdeveloped, uh, or if it would, uh, you know, would throw the balance of built form and natural format, which is a big part of the official plan's vision for how waterfront development should be on these properties. To me, that uh, does not happen with these proposed uh, additions to these buildings or reconfigurations. And finally, through site plan control, um, staff, I'm sure, will have a close look at uh, the shoreline of, the, of this property, whether or not there's any areas that could be uh, revegetated or, I guess, bolstered, uh, particularly, I'm sure, in the area of the boardwalk. Um, staff will probably have some, some uh, ideas of maybe there could be some tree planting along there that would soften that look a little bit as well. So. Overall, I believe the intent of the official plan, or I guess the bylaw that's proposed in front of you today, it conforms to the official plan, and I concur with staff's opinion that it should be approved. And I'll be happy to answer any questions we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else speaking for this? Anyone opposed to this? Well, any questions from council? Councillor Jaglowitz? <coughs> Yes, through you to, to staff. Um, as I understand your recommendation, you're approving the 192 feet in width. And my concern is that I don't have a concern with the way that dock's configured now, but it, it, if you just approve it, we just approve it that way, in theory, there could be a 66 foot wide uh, long dock go out, where now it's only a very small shoreline width. How, how, how do you intend to control that? Mr. Allen? Through you. Uh, the bylaw in front of the committee uh, it, it has a very explicit wording. It specifically references as shown on the plans attached. This is the plan that's attached. If committee has concerns that future dock extensions could be made in the future, um, they could explicitly state in the bylaw that no future dock additions be permitted. Uh, but typically when we have um, over with dock, uh, proposals in front of council now committee um, 
referring in the bylaw to as shown on the plans attached um, has satisfied many of those concerns in the past. Anyone else? Councillor Nishikawa? I'm, it's getting late. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. The bar. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying. Because um, I'm freezing, by the way. <laughs> um, Ryan, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Uh, normally, when we see these type of applications come forward, where there's existing structures and, and, um, uh, and docks and things, and there's offered up some removal of some things or, or some giving back, if you want to call it that, or whatever, bringing us back closer to conformity. Um, and yes, we've made a small dent in the size of the bunkie, which was already oversized. Um, but I haven't been able to quite follow, and in fact, some of those green markers on the plan that I have have confused me a little bit of what's existing so I, I'm always trying to jump back but I, I guess I'm I don't see where um, there's been that attempt to try to uh, reduce that particular impact and, and, and when, I, when I'm looking at especially the shoreline developments uh, and you know we, we heard that this could be subdivided well then of course that would only be hundred and fifty feet total if we were to stick to our bylaw um, you know we're being asked for hundred and ninety two point seven um, is there something I'm missing here like are we has that there been an approach there at all to so for instance we've had these applications come forward where they would have removed for instance that little boardwalk through you. Um, the official plan does encourage when properties are undergoing redevelopment and exemptions are required to the bylaw that improvements be made where possible. Um, as you've noted, the sleeping cabin is being reduced in area uh, by from approximately uh, 830 square feet to 810 square feet, 813 square feet. The setback of that sleeping cabin is also being increased, um, although a marginal amount, about you know, 2.7 feet from the shoreline. Um, there isn't any dock that's proposed to be removed as part of this application. I, th I think Mr. Veratis has, has has pointed out, you know, quite realistically that you know, the bylaws a one size fits all um, type document, and depending how you view a, a dock, for example, from the shoreline, it may not necessarily have the same appearance as the way the bylaw measures it. Um, there has been no there's been no proposal as part of this application to remove any dock. Um, it's before the committee, the, the applicant's agent is here, if, if it's the will of the committee to start reducing the dock width, um, they could consider that. And this application could return to the committee um, with a revised proposal. Um, you could also amend the bylaw to include a specific dock width um, if there's a number that you're more satisfied with than, than others. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, you know, it's, it's a complicated shoreline and there's a lot of existing development all of the development on the site today can be replaced as of right one to one so they can maintain the two sleeping cabins with the much oversized sleeping cabin at the same setback so um, from my perspective improvements are being made you know, they may be seen as nominal um, but you know it, it's not um, uh, it's not an easy property to redevelop particularly when the existing structures are so close to the water and there's an existing large amount of cumulative dock width spread across three separate locations on the property Anyone else? Oh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through you to staff, I too um, I don't see any give back here for improvement. That I don't. The length of the dock that we'll I'll refer to as the shoreline dock is significant and would never be allowed. Uh, to be done again if it was ever allowed then and, I, and they talked about you know we could put some, plant some trees but from my experience the, the 
the wildlife, that is a barrier to wildlife of any type, that, 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 that uh, dock. And I think uh, that uh, a lot of it should be removed, in my opinion. I don't know what my other councillors feel about that, but I think it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's wrapped in a dock. Like they talk about the dock out in the water, the whole shoreline is wrapped in a dock. Mayor Harding. Thank you. Um, question to staff, uh, and then I'll provide a comment. So the boardwalk, which I think is the most contentious in the end of the bay, if that was to move five feet onto shore, if you will, and connect, because it looks like it's going over one of my pictures here uh, on page 360 shows it kind of cutting that point. You can actually see it on the site plan there. If that moved five feet onto shore, it's no longer a dock. It's no longer shoreline coverage. So my, my concern in what we ask, so I'm getting confirmation that they can move it five feet on a shore. They still have the boardwalk to walk from one end of the property to the other through the sort of wetland, marshy area type of thing. There's no change to habitat. Um, we could ask for the main dock in front of the cottage, which is measuring 43 and a half feet, which is eight feet wide, to straighten out. So we're going to remove some fish habitat and cribs. We're going to put new cribs in to straighten out the dock to save 35 feet of shoreline coverage. We can remove the boardwalk waterfront, move it five feet into shore, disturb other natural habitat at this particular point to be in conformity. I think we're doing more harm on this particular property than we are in good. We're moving a sleeping cabin back and we have some, we have some unique properties here. This is one of them. It, it may not be a hundred feet back in the thing, but everything is net a little bit better. And I think we do more harm in forcing them to remove some of the stock and move it somewhere else to access the other side of the property. So I'm in favor of the application. Thank you. Um, am I allowed to speak? Give my opinion? Thank you. Good. This is it. A learning curve. Um, this is, I think, a very unique property, too. It's an old, old property that's been around for a long, long time. And I don't see any problem with what they're asking for at this point. So, are you on the call? Of course. Well, I just was wondering. <laughs> I, I do have a, a concern because of when we did fourteen fourteen, and we had actually identified and spent time on properties like this, uh, for instance, when we were um, looking at setbacks and whether the redevelopment of uh, situations where we uh, would have a, a different scale on um, redevelopment of, of uh, certain parts of the cottage, for instance, and, and, and if they were that much closer to the water, they would not be allowed to be able to become a two-story uh, over water and those sort of things. Um, I believe that they're asking to make the boathouse larger. Um, and my concern is that there is no give back and, and that in fact um, we're only going to add to a situation that would normally not, um, it was okay way, way back when, but it's not okay today. And it's certainly not okay going through 1414 in all of the discussions that we had about our waterfront structures and um, and that type of thing. I would have uh, felt more comfortable if there were, as I said, some give back. Um, and you know, I, I heard the mayor's comment about moving the uh, the boardwalk five feet onto shore. Well, in fact, don't forget that's supposed to be a vegetative buffer zone. I would question if that would, you know, where does that come into play? Um, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm really struggling with this because I, I just feel that um, I, I don't, I don't see there's an urgency. I don't see that there's a, you know, some reason at all other than human need that, uh, to, to add to some of the, the shoreline structure. Uh, so I'm, I'm really challenged with this, and I, I'm. I'll just leave it at that. 
Committee Member Edwards. Thank you. Uh, in some ways, I uh, do struggle with this, but when you look at page, um, I think it's 360, from the water and that, when you, you, you see that, it just looks like a, a deck on shore. You, you really can't tell. Uh, the next one. Down a bit. Just a minute. Um, it's not the one I want. It's it's the the view from the lake I w would like there, Ryan. Oh, two fifty nine. Sorry. Yeah, that one there. From the water, you're not going to go in in that that type by boat, and uh, if you're uh, going by that property, and that and it just looks like a dock. And uh, I think the mayor is right. If you you start taking it out and that, you're going to cause as much problem as as changing it. So, uh, in this case, I uh, can support this. Any more comments or questions? Oh, sir. Just, just one more comment. Again, I would hate to see them have to angle the dock straight. Number two, none of the neighbors are opposing this. There's no, the immediate neighbor says, fine, let's go ahead and do this, and everybody in the circulation area. I will tell you, I drive by this property by water daily. I actually thought it was a beach at the end, not a boardwalk. From the water, from without standing, that picture was obviously taken from the end of the dock. When you drive by this property, it looks like a beach. So I, I'm, I really don't like over and micromanaging. There is some net improvement on the property. It may not be as much as we want, but the neighbors and the people in the area don't seem to have a problem. So I'm in support. Any other comments? I mean, one of the things that could be done is leave the boathouse the size it is and let everything else happen. That would be an option. Just throw that out. Just so any other comments from anyone? No? Okay, I'm going to read the motion then. Because it's here somewhere. Okay. Moved by you've been busy, <coughs> Councillor Edwards. Um, seconded by uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Council that Bylaw 2019-82 and Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-13-19, Newlands Roll Number 5-6-038, be approved. Any discussion? I think. What? Oh, sorry. Just to make a point of administrative clarification, uh, I have on, on my record Zoning Bylaw Amendment 1319, Bylaw 2019-55. Uh, I believe you referred to a, a bylaw with 2013 number. Maybe it's just a matter of double checking. Bylaw 2019-85. 55. 82. Yes, 82. Right. Sorry, it should be 55. 55. Okay. All right. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Council that Bylaw 2019-55 and Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-13-19, Newlands Roll Number 5-6-038, be approved. All in favor? One, two, three, and eight. Oh, four. Okay. Opposed? Carried. Carried. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. And we'll move to our next one, which is the YMCA. And Mr. Allen, I think you're on again. Let me just. Um, uh, yes. To the clerk's perspective, uh, and ask the question into our director of planning. I, I think it is appropriate that we include our submission comments at this point, or you don't think so? Just because it, like, it's fresh, it's in our mind. And I can tell you one of the reasons that I would support this last application was no negative comments from the neighbors. Um, if there was some negative comments, then absolutely my decision might have been different. 
and by trying to remember that back 30 days from now when this comes to council I'm just thinking I, I is it possible to record that and from a pro put a note today through the chair I, I guess I don't think there's a harm in in maybe noting it in the minutes I appreciate the concern that you might not recall but I think my read of the Planning Act is um, that effect of any oral or written submissions prior to the council decision so if you recall at council there's an opportunity for any member of the public to delegate again for for two minutes technically council has not approved of the bylaw yet and it could happen that a bylaw even though the planning committee recommended it with a full council may be defeated um, so I wouldn't recommend that a sort of final decision on the impact of uh, of a written oral s submissions be made until the final decision at council so I would uh, maybe we can try to come up with an easier uh, some way to have uh, that recollection 30 days later and try to think about that uh, to assist council uh, but I think it should wait until until then I appreciate that through you if I may Madam Chair with the um, uh, may I suggest then effect on committee is noted in the minutes just as a, as a differentiation it's, it's not an effect on council but it's an effect on this committee or it is for me and my committee decision that could be referenced uh, should I need to back in council Councillor Edwards I personally I guess I would look to the clerk I don't have concerns with with noting it in the minutes um, my typical preference is usually uh, consistency and we should do that uh, for all I guess the clerk would probably say the minutes should be without note or comment um, but I think if it's a consensus of committee that it be noted that uh, the lack of public opposition weighed on the committee I, I don't have a concern with noting that in, in the minutes so I look to uh, the clerk well we're supposed to be following the Planning Act so I would suggest that maybe those notes are taken down and staff include them in the staff report to council that's what I would suggest Right, so we're on to the YMCA and Mr. Allen, are you are again? Thank you. This is a public meeting for Zoning Bylaw Amendment 1919, Bylaw 2019-82, in the name of YMCA. The lands are known municipally as 1090 Galwing Lake Road and are presently in the ownership of the Young Men's Christian Association and are known locally as YMCA Camp Pinecrest. Multiple Private camp buildings are located on the property, including camper and staff cabins, activity buildings, dining and kitchen facilities, docks, and other buildings and structures related to the camp. The applicant proposes to construct a sailor se sailing center building with an attached sun deck and a dock. The purpose of this bylaw is to amend Section 1-2 of Bylaw 2010-126, being that no new buildings or structures are permitted that are not shown on the Phase 1 development plan. The applicant proposes to construct a dock and a sailor sailing center building with an attached sun deck that are not presently shown on phase one of the development plan. A sailing center gazebo is shown on phase one of the development plan, but the applicant proposes to construct an enclosed building instead of a gazebo. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to section 2.5 of bylaw 2010-1 and 26, being the maximum permitted gross floor area of 19,040 square feet in the phase one development plan. The applicant proposes to construct a 399 square foot sailing center building resulting in 19,439 square feet of gross floor area. A sailing center, a sailing gazebo is shown on phase one, but was not included in the maximum gross floor area because it is not enclosed. The purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to section 423 of bylaw 2014 being the minimum permitted front yard setback of 66 feet for buildings and structures in the private camp WC 4A1 zone and section 27 of bylaw 2010-126 being that no new buildings that contribute to gross floor area shall be located closer than 30 meters 100 feet of the high water mark with the exception of a sailing gazebo which is permitted to be located within 20 meters 66 feet of the high water mark the applicant proposes to construct a sailor sailing center I'm tongue tied on that one a sailing center building that contributes to gross floor area with a front yard setback of 10 meters 35 feet the purpose of this bylaw is also to provide an exemption to section 4253 of bylaw 2014 being the minimum permitted front yard setback of 50 feet for a sun deck 
The applicant proposes to construct a sun deck attached to the sailing, sailing center building with a front yard setback of 27 feet. This bylaw will have the effect of permitting a dock and a sailor, sailing center building with attached sun deck to be included in the phase one development plan, permitting 19,439 square feet of gross floor area in the phase one development plan, permitting a sailor, sailing center building to be constructed with a front yard setback of 35 feet and permitting a sun deck to be constructed with a front yard setback of 27 feet. We've received two pieces of correspondence related to this application, the first from the District of Muskoka, they have no objection. We have received a letter of support um, from Art Rempel at 1007 Gallwing Lake Road. They are in favor of, he's in favor of this application. We've also received comments from the Development Services Department, Public Works Department, and Emergency Services Department at the Township, uh, and all three departments have no objection to this application. Uh, there is a site plan and an enlarged uh, area um, included uh, on the site plan drawing on page 440 of your agenda package. Um, staff would happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Is there anyone here to speak on behalf of this application? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I've been a long day, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, my name is Cole Balmer from Camp Pinecrest at 1090 Gullwing Lake Road in Torrance, Ontario, P1, POC1MO. Um, so yeah, it really was a, uh, something we just overlooked by getting the, the dock, if we want to think of it as two different things. The dock was uh, an oversight that we designed to put a sailing building and forgot to put a dock. Um, our fault, and we're trying to make it right. Um, as the building goes, we're trying to put a small building to store those types of things um, for sailing to be able to teach and get out of the weather if they're having those kind of a, you know, inclement days. And, uh, and the, the thought was to have it a little bit closer to shore. Um, we do realize we've got a, a shoreline allowance uh, that is not, um, it's not really ours, I guess, is the, the tricky part with us. Um, so it's for us, I'd love it to have that close. If it's going to cause a lot of uh, issue and strife to get us there, then we would move it back to that 66 feet, and that would be okay with us as well. So um, really we're just looking for the allowance to build and allowance to build the dock as well. But if there's any questions, let me know. Anyone else like to speak in favor of this? Anyone opposed? No? Oh, um, committee, any questions? Councillor Nishik. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to add a comment that um, Cole did a presentation at the Clear Lake Cottage Association meeting. And um, I would suggest, and, and Councillor Zadix or, or the mayor could comment on that, that there was no opposition. Um, and, and, you know, that association has been through all of the development plans for the camp um, and, and over the years have, have voiced their concerns when they had it and there hasn't been that, uh, that concerned about this particular uh, application. And, and I will just add that, um, so some of us who have sat around this table while other camps, you know, and people complained that there was children laughing and having fun we're so glad to hear so many kids having fun at that camp so and i'm 100 acres away by the way but i'm just saying it, it it's a it's a joy to hear so great okay anyone else all right i will read the motion then uh move by wow Maybe who's that, that? Um, oh okay <laughs> Maybe if I could just. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, through the chair. Um, I, I guess this might be more of a question for the the applicant. Uh, the draft resolution before planning committee uh, staff has no objections to the proposal either. However, uh, regardless, of, if committee and council were to ultimately approve it, you, they would not be able to obtain a building permit on a municipally owned shore road allowance. So the recommendation is that the approval be subject to the closure. And I don't know if the camp is able or, or willing. Um, it's an extensive amount over, I think, 3,000 feet of frontage of a shore allowance that you'd have to purchase. I heard in your comments that you'd be willing to relocate the structure back to six, uh, 66 feet. I don't know if that's something the Planning Committee wishes to discuss um, to amend the resolution um, that it be approved subject to a setback of 66 feet as opposed to the, subject to the closure of uh, an original shore allowance. But I would look again to the applicant if they have comments or committee if, if there's any questions or discussion on that. Yes, please comment on that. 
Um, really, at this point, I, I do really this brought up a lot of concern of the fact of that 66 foot allowance is not ours. Um, so, really, for me, it brings in a lot of fear of whose is it and who's responsible for liability and all the other things that we have on that shoreline. Um, as far as this building goes and for this proposal, we are fine to move it 66 feet, feet back. We can move forward with this, in, in my mind. Um, but I will question that, and I will probably come to you guys next week or sometime down the road when I'm a little less busy. Um, to speak about what we can do with it, and if that's purchasing it or whatever that is, but it's uh, there's lots of buildings on that shoreline. You can see two more in this building that are already there. One's even probably closer than it's actually drawn to the shore, and uh, we have docks. We have kids on the water all the time. For me, it's safety and who's liable if anybody does get injured or those types of things. So, um, yeah, and as a charity, it's it's the, the dollar amount's a, a big component for us of making that happen. Um, we have. And we have other concerns on our other lake, on Gullwing Lake. Uh, it's a bit even more of a concern for um, people that are neighbors or that are using that lake that are not us, that are using our shoreline and inappropriately. So um, as far as this application goes, we're entirely fine moving it 66 feet back. It'd probably be more on this drawing, I guess, uh, up to the upper right, um, kind of just in a natural spot that we had found out when Ryan and I did a site walk. Um, but um, moving forward, I'd love to talk about how to alleviate that um, that understanding of whose land that is and who's liable for those types of things. Thank you. Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you. Just a uh, conversation with the uh, Director of Planning that it could be a combination of 66 feet back or closure of the shore road allowance. So I, I think he's putting words somewhat to that effect. Thank you. Okay, so moved by Councillor Jaz I can't speak anymore. Jagowitz and uh, Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that Planning Committee recommend to Council that Bylaw 2019-82 and Zoning Bylaw Amendment ZBA-19-19, the Young Men's Christian Association, Roll Number 6-8-094 be approved subject to the closure and conveyance of the original road allowance fronting on Clear Lake or relocation of any proposed structures to not be located on the original shore road allowance. Questions, comments? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Carries. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I think now we're going to go to, to yes. All right. So, Mr. Diamond, I know you've been you've been waiting a while. Mr. Pink will introduce you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Committee. On uh, page 453 in your agenda packages, staff has prepared. Uh, a brief report. Uh, you may recall at the last council meeting in June, uh, council did appoint uh, what was ended up uh, termed a working official plan review working committee uh, to review the official plan. Uh, appointed that, and there was some discussion um, during that process, and a request was made. Uh, we did have an inaugural meeting on June 27th, and the request was made to bring the notes or, or minutes of that meeting to a future planning committee, uh, which staff has done. You'll see uh, the notes of that meeting uh, beginning in page 455 of your agenda packages. I think they speak for themselves. It was a rather introductory initial meeting and a lot of good uh, discussion on uh, the various visions and uh, competing interests in the municipality. And again, happy to answer any questions if, if committee has on those. And also during the discussion, there were some questions had on the overall process um, uh, in general. And uh, Mr. Jim Diamond is one of the consultants who we've retained to do this project. And he's graciously agreed to attend today um, and perhaps answer some questions for committee and provide some uh, further background. Um, I would just lastly note, uh, also as you note in, um, in my report, there's a brief touch on some of the next steps. I know we have discussed uh, a visioning session in Milford Bay Community Center next Friday from 1 to 4. And also a public meeting notice has been circulated in the paper and in various, uh, uh, various methods uh, for the first statutory public meeting on August 16th. That will be in front of this planning committee at its next meeting. That's a statutory requirement under the Planning Act. 
typically held early on or onset of the process to hear the community's visions on the current plan and, and perhaps what could be uh, changed. Um, there was some discussion or questions whether additional visiting visioning sessions were necessary or warranted given the location. Fortunately, that was one of the only community centers available on that day. Uh, I'm happy to, um, again, speak to that if committee wishes to discuss further um, if additional sessions are warranted. So I will leave it to uh, Mr. Diamond. I believe you all uh, know him, but uh, he's one of the joint consultants leading the, the project. Great. And the first thing I should do is make sure that uh, when my name appears, Regrouped with my former partner Nick McDonald, who still is working under Meridian Planning Consultants in Vaughan, Ontario, to uh, to do this project. Um, I am now independently employed on Skeleton Lake, which is wonderful. And uh, as I said to the steering, you know, the working committee, it's hard for me to get used to the names. Uh, I'm. It's quite amazing for me that it was 40 years ago that I spoke to council in this office the first time. <laughs> <laughs> you're not so bad yourself, Councillor. Uh, you've been around. You've been around for a little while yourself. Um, so uh, I'm very, very happy to be working on this project. I will say that uh, in my current status of life, I didn't anticipate working on another official plan um, at this time in my life. But when this opportunity came up, um, I am extremely dedicated to this municipality and to the district of Muskoka, and I uh, look forward to this as an opportunity to use my 40 years of experience to make sure that the project is done right and, uh, and that's what I'm here for. Um, I want to talk briefly on what's happening in the very near future. Um, next Friday we're doing a visioning session um, which is being conducted by Lura. Lura is a very highly regarded public consultation planning firm. They do work all over the province and we connected with them for a couple of reasons. Nick and I are in the later stages of our career and we know about Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, but it's critical for us to get the people that have a full head of hair or maybe no gray hair involved in this process. And so we thought we need to find people, young people, who can use social media and attract other young people to this project. Um, and so we have Lure doing that. So they're going to be leading the visioning session next Friday in Milford Bay. That session. Um, I love doing those sessions because they're really light and you, you, you facilitate the session but you're there to hear what people want to say and you know kind of the key question is describe to me the Township Muskoka Lakes in 2040. Where do we want to be? And our objective is to try to put that into a vision to tell us how we get there and to create a plan of how we get there. Your strategic plan is a little helpful but it was done by the previous council and Mr. Hammond tells me you're looking at updating that with with this council and that's a great idea. The session next Friday will help you, uh, those of you who are attending, and us to understand what the vision of, of 2040 in uh, Muskoka Lakes will be. Uh, the next time that we meet as planning committee is, uh, as uh, David indicated under the, well, I call it the section 26 meeting. The planning act says you have to have a special meeting uh, when you update your official plan and invite members of the public to come and speak to you and tell you what you should be doing with your official plan. What works, what doesn't work. It reminds me of that old TV show, Nip Tuck, What Don't You Like About Yourself? Um, but uh, that's the purpose of the meeting. So again, that's an easy e meeting for us because we just sit and listen, but keep track of what's going on. Uh, so I'm going to attend that meeting as well. Um, my uh, ability to attend meetings here is based on the fact that I live 20 minutes away. Um, 25 if I drive the speed limit down Brackenrig Road, but um, about 20 minutes uh, away on Skeleton Lake and so I can be here. Um, David had mentioned to uh, me when we were uh, doing a review of how all of this works that this committee wanted to be more involved in the, in the project than what the work program indicates because we have this working committee and they are a cross-section of the community um, and, and uh, representatives of the municipality who are going to give us a sense of, you know, I call it ground truthing exactly what's going on. Um, and so I will say that over the last, uh, well, since our, our working committee meeting, uh, David and Nick McDonald and I have been having conversations about how we get this committee more involved in the process within the budget that we have. Um, and we've managed to tweak some hours. We're still working on that. 
where I think I can be here six times, in the, six more times in the next two years uh, to kind of update you and get your thoughts on where we are at, uh, at a, a session like that. Um, and I'm happy to do that. I will say, you know, scheduled for 11.30, it's 2.30 now. I'm on your dime at three bucks a minute. So we should, uh, <laughs> uh, we need to be cautious about that. Um, but if we, um, you know, if we plan those meetings well, and I can shave a little bit of time off a few things. I know I had, I know this committee is very interested in recreational carrying capacity, and I had a lot of time um, in, in the work program working on that. Um, I'm working with Graham Good at the district. Graham is a god in GIS, and uh, the work that he's done is actually going to save me a whole bunch of time, so I can take that time and shift it over to coming here a couple more Fridays and giving you some quick updates and things. So I think that's, that, that's what we're going to do. That's one example of, of how it can work. So um, David and Nick and I are working on kind of, I'll call it a change of scope, but the objective is not to change the budget, but just to change where the effort goes in so that all of us in this room get to see each other a little bit more often throughout the process. So if that's the case, the terms of reference would then have us, or the, the change of scope would have us as planning committee meeting about eight times in the next two years uh, to go through the process. So that's kind of a, a, quick, a quick summary of the, uh, the um, community engagement. Um, we have the open house next week. There'll be two more open houses, which are you know, somewhat relaxed opportunities for people to come and talk to us about what's going on. Once we figure out what planning directions we're, we're looking at, and there's a series of papers that we're going to do that are outlined in the, in the work program, we'll talk to them again. And then once we start developing policy, we'll have another session where people can look at that. Allure is going to do what they call pop-ups, um, and they're going to go for half a day and set up a tent and just be someplace where there's a, where there's people. I like uh, Liz McCarty from uh, Lura said, "What well, we've learned, you have to go where the people are already there, so they don't have to go to see you." So uh, you know, maybe next year it's too late for this year, but maybe next year they set up a tent for the morning at the uh, the antique boat show, um, or you know, other opportunities, the uh, MLA. Uh, annual meeting or something like that where they just set up a thing and there's a, a tent and there's two people there and you can go in and talk to them and, and do that sort of thing. We're working with the municipality um, on setting up online stuff um, and getting, uh, getting things working on the, on the website. Um, I've committed to the project team to answer emails because I can sit in my office on the top floor of my boathouse with a cup of tea in the morning and answer a couple of emails without having a huge impact on the, uh, on the project. And um, we'll be working with the working committee throughout the, this process to make sure that we are, are grounded. I like the, I like the, com the composition of the working committee. Um, I recognize a lot of the people that are, that are on it and they have different views. And that's critical, of course. Diverse views bring strong projects and uh, great products. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Oh, um, Councilor Jaglowitz. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Diamond, one of my concerns is the um, you mentioned uh, to where we want to be in 2040, and I think that's, that's, that's a good objective, but I'm concerned that where we're going to be in May of 2020. And that's, uh, if we look at your list of uh, subjects, uh, if we go down, we'll see one of them is, um, is uh, resort policies. And I, I, I'm sure you're aware that we have an interim control bylaw uh, on the net that will expire in 10 months from now. And so in order to, uh, uh, the goal is to t attempt to have some revised uh, resort policy in place passed by the township and the district by that time frame. And I just wondered how you're fitting that into your schedule. Can that piece kind of get pulled out or are, are we just giving up on trying to, to do that? We're relying heavily on the committee there to be providing recommendations um, on how that works. The objective is to dovetail it into the into the process, um, and it really is a question of the timing of how that committee works with the with the policies and what the recommendations coming out of that are um, for for timing. Um, so we've got till, as you say, spring 2020 to figure out how to bring that policy framework forward, whether it's a separate amendment. I'm going to guess it's probably going to be a separate amendment. Um, and I would also recommend that it be a separate amendment because you don't want to tie up your whole official plan on one issue. Um, so you're better off to deal with something that's as controversial and, and, and significant as that as a separate document and then make sure that it dovetails with the official plan at the end. 
I, just one moment. I'm going to let Mr. Pink jump in here. Uh, just to clarify, as I know, like Mr. Diamond has been overly involved in in that process, and I I have. Um, there's certainly the resort issue, uh, which is a broader township, if not district-wide, uh, matter. The interim control bylaw and, and that committee has been set up to review the policies for Minette. And yes, that expires May, I believe it is, uh, 2020. Uh, my plan for that, the, that committee that uh, this council has set up, uh, or sorry, the previous uh, term of council, uh, is working diligently to uh, review those policies. And the goal is to, as Mr. Diamond, I think, correctly pointed out, my vision has been a separate official plan amendment, uh, ideally passed uh, before that interim control bylaw expires. And then it will be a, simply a matter of taking those approved policies and dovetailing or putting them in, in this plan. The resort policy issue is yet another uh, significant issue, um, which we're also reaching out to the district and we're going to have uh, discussions about how to dovetail those issues as part of our official plan review as well. As committee members may recall, um, the district official plan, when they updated it, uh, left the resort issue aside, which has now put it in a little bit of an interesting situation that we're going through our process. Um, so we're going to work with them closely, and uh, I think we're putting our heads together about how to solve that uh, dilemma. Um, but with the Minette situation, it should work fairly well if everything uh, falls into place as it should. So maybe a supplemental. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I think the last time you and I talked, uh, uh, you had not indicated that that would be a separate piece. So I think that's very important. And I think in order to meet that deadline, that should probably be on this planning committee's agenda for every meeting to follow that through. Because that's uh, my understanding is that Minette's steering committee are not going to have anything till the end of this year or early next year. So we will have to have done some of our public, uh, whatever the public piece is, David, that we have to do. We can't just pass an OPA without having a public meeting. And I was hoping that that could take place at the same time as you're doing the other. Uh, you know, could those two things be kind of moving side by side? If I can yes. Yes. Through the chair. Um, that's correct. Uh, any official plan amendment, the Planning Act would require that at least one statutory public meeting uh, is held. I can certainly say that I've advised the Manette Joint Steering Committee on, on numerous occasions and stressed the importance. Probably looking at a you know an absolute bare minimum of four, if not six months, uh, to go through that process. So we're hopeful of getting some recommendations uh, this fall, um, so that there's enough time to have an amendment before you uh, by May 2020. And certainly, I certainly recall, and I'm sure it's in some minutes and and reports, when the interim control bylaw was passed, uh, staff stressed to council the ex you know extremely limited uh, tight timelines to pull off a project of this nature in that. Uh, two years um, and we continue to work towards it um, but it is a, a tall task and we will do our best yes councillor Nishikawa thank you um, I, I think I'll just go to David because you've been around pretty long too um, <laughs> just just to give the rest of the council an understanding generally these this process, the OP process, and, and our interim control by, or not our, in, sorry, um, our zoning bylaws and things, it's kind of like a three or four or five year process. It's, it's not, we're not looking at this taking two years. Like, as in, we're not, we're hoping, or, I mean, that would be fantastic, but I, I, I just wanted to stress that it wasn't something that was going to happen in a year from now or two years from now. I think it's it's always been a longer process and I just wanted people to have that awareness that it, uh, you know, it's not something that we're going to hopefully put a stamp on at 20, the end of 2020 sort of thing. Mr. Chair, you know, certainly I don't want at the very first, one of the very first meetings on the official plan review already blow our uh, timelines uh, and double them. <laughs> but Budget. <laughs> but it, it is, you are generally correct. I mean, uh, all these very large projects go in with good intentions and, and schedules, like any home renovation project. Uh, they sometimes do tend to take a bit longer. I can say uh, the official plan review of the last time uh, it was joined as an official plan and zoning by the review started, I believe it was in 06. Um, and, you know, it was probably a two, three year plan at that time. And we eventually passed 2014, 14, and 2015. So nine years it took. Um, so issues do come up. Um, again, at this early stage, I'm going to remain 
optimistic and honor consultants to deliver this project on budget and on schedule. Um, I think, but I, you know, I don't want to mislead. I, I think next, late next year is, is somewhat of an optimistic schedule, but certainly my ultimate goal is certainly to have a document before council that council can unanimously support in your term, I think is a, is a good goal. Uh, and, and obviously a little bit before the election, hopefully. Um, but I certainly, uh, that's the goal there. Uh, just before I forget, just further to committee member Jack Lewitt's question, um, minutes or records from the Minette Joint Committee do become public, so I think I can say this. Uh, at the last meeting, there, have, there were discussions on that committee becoming better informed by gathering some public uh, opinion, and they are looking out to reach out to the public this summer. Uh, to get some feedback from the community on the character of Muskoka uh, with respect to density and those types of issues so that they can make more informed recommendations to this committee. Um, so I think you had some questions about getting some public feedback and having the matter on the agenda. That uh, Manette committee is looking to do that uh, at some point this summer. They've taken it upon themselves. But there has been a lot of feedback on that issue, obviously through the district official plan review public meeting. I'm sure most recall in the fall of 2017, uh, and various other condominium applications on resort issues and the public meetings uh, on Minette that the developer hosted. Um, I, I think the public sentiment is, is fairly clear, um, but that committee is looking for some further feedback this summer. So I'll try to keep uh, this committee informed so you can stay abreast of that and perhaps attend uh, as well if you wish. Oh, and David, I, I could just, there's two little things I just wanted to mention to the committee while we're here. The first of all um, is in terms of some of the things that I'm doing. This morning's a good example where I was talking to David. He said there's a very interesting application coming on the planning committee. It should be an interesting public meeting. So I came this morning to see the public meeting. I'm here to learn. I'm not charging my time for it, but it's an important kind of a thing. And from time to time, if it's a rainy Friday and I'm not doing anything, I'm going to sit in the back and listen to interesting things that are going on so that we know what's what's going on. I think that's an important thing. The other thing I wanted planning committee to understand going into this process, I've heard lots of members of the committee say, oh, our official plan, it's so hard to understand and, and uh, it, it's complicated. Um, understand a little bit of the history of your official plan is that back in the day um, when I had more hair on my head, the district did all the planning for the lower tier municipalities. And then at some stage in, Derek, would it be the mid-70s, late 70s, the district said the lower tier municipalities can do official plans for the waterfront areas and for their hamlets, but the rural areas still were under the district official plan. And then eventually the lower tier municipalities did um, official plans to cover their rural areas, so they had lower tier official plans that covered the entire township. But your official plan is a great example of seeing how you started off here and then you just slapped on another piece here and you slapped on another piece there and you've got policies that deal with the same thing in different sections of the plan that don't say the same thing. And so one of the things we talked to the steering committee about is okay, really it's an opportunity to start from scratch and write a whole official plan from page one to page not 265, I promise you. Um, and, uh, and, and look at the whole thing as a continuous document rather than a series of patches that have gone into it. So that's one of the things we'll do. Any other questions of Mr. Tymon? Thank you, Jim. Thank you. We'll see you next month, yep. if not in the store. <laughs> I believe our next is Mr. Pink with um, the Lipipit and Quarry proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on page 451 in your agenda packages is a brief report outlining the history of the Lipa property with respect to the uh, more recent planning applications that have been made on it. Uh, again, at the last council meeting in June, uh, there was, if you recall, an official plan amendment application on the agenda uh, that council did defeat and there was a request to provide some background information on what has occurred uh, with respect to those applications to date. So I've tried to break that down on a chronological basis into a fairly brief uh, self-explanatory uh, report. Um, and uh, I can update you that the appeal to the refusal that you made last month uh, just landed on my desk yesterday, which was everything uh, we expected. Um, so the process, uh, continues and happy to answer any questions uh, councillors may have on this uh, matter. 
Any questions? Looks like your report was really good. <laughs> or it's a long day. Yeah, yeah, or it's a long day, that's right. So, okay, so is everybody's good with that? All right, that's great. Thank you very much. So our last um, last item is developmental services. It's a discussion and consideration of a resolution, re the OPP, and a committee member Jagowitz, um, I believe, asked that this be put on the agenda. So I'm going to ask him to speak to it. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background and then to indicate that I have turned this matter over to the CAO to, to handle, but he felt that it would be, a, the appropriate way to handle it would be for this committee to make a resolution, and, and so that's why it's here. Uh, in, in, uh, in the May, I, I'm a member of the Finance and, and, uh, and um, Communities, and it's not Community Service, it's uh, Corporate Services at the District, and they're responsible for policing uh, for us. Uh, I brought up at that meeting in May that was there any way that to possibly the OPP could get get involved in somewhat when, when our bylaw officer is not available or in difficult situations after hours. Uh, the uh, staff at that meeting contacted Michael Burton, who's in charge of in, in charge of the OPP for our section, and um, and I met with him on uh, June 19th, and the meeting went. Uh, uh, it was difficult to indicate that um, uh, there would have to be all sorts of special rules put in place and so on and so forth. But after about an hour's discussion, he said, oh, well, that, that's a service we, you're paying for now, and, you, and we can, we're happy to provide it. So let me indicate what he said. He said that um, what he would envision is that the bylaw officer or the staff here would merely meet with him or his uh, his staff sergeant, uh, David Pynchon, and work out a protocol. And that protocol would be in writing. And so if a person had a problem with bylaw enforcement, let's say it's 11 o'clock Friday night and there's a noise issue, and our bylaw officer's not there, a call could be placed to the OPP, and the OPP would already understand that this is a bylaw after hours bylaw infraction, and unless they had an unusual workload, they would attend they would fill out a form that had been previously agreed on. They would uh, find out who the people are that are responsible for the infraction. They would take down the information, and they would then uh, make that available to the bylaw officer when he comes back, you know, the next day or, or the Monday. And they would also um, uh, act as a witness at, uh, in court. And he said they're already doing that for, for others, and that it's just necessary for that protocol to be set up. So I believe this motion, the purpose of this motion, is to authorize staff to, to look into that and do a report and, and, and come back. Well, at, the, at a meeting we had here a few months ago, it was indicated that the, the OPP would not respond to those no, things. No, they will not enforce them by mm -hmm. but, but just the, remember we talked about hiring a second bylaw officer and so on and so forth. Right. It just seems that after hours, which is when a lot of these occur, they should be called. And there should, if, if the public knows they can place that call, then, so I, I still think it's worthwhile setting up that protocol. Okay, well, then, then, then I guess the public should be made aware. Okay, so if the protocol is in place, then I believe that perhaps we can have some sort of an informational sheet or, so thank you. Madam Chair, I think uh, what Mr. Donald is referring to is the fact that if somebody calls the OPP with respect to a matter, 
they're going to attend the scene. But what the subtle difference is, is that other matters, other bylaw matters, um, they don't typically attend to. In addition, if they do attend a disturbance call, they will not be laying a charge, or they don't lay a charge under the noise bylaw. I think that's the subtle distinction that Mr. Donald's trying to draw. If you're wanting the OPP to attend after hours calls and lay charges under the bylaws, we're happy to investigate that, if that clarifies what's being asked. Just through me, that, that's not, uh, uh, that's not was, uh, uh, that's not what was, what was being asked. The fact that they attend and that they, and that they take down the information about who, they're documenting that the occurrence and then they're passing it on to, to the bylaw officer for prosecution and they're there to act, act as a witness. And I think that's, that'll go 90% of the way of solving the problem. Madam uh, Chair, sometime, it, it all depends as well as to what the complainant is asking the OPP to do. If they call about a noise complaint against our bylaw, the OPP will advise the complainant that they do not enforce that bylaw. I, I think what you, what you have to do is meet with them because I was told differently. I was told that they will make an arrangement to attend on bylaw infractions after hours, okay? They will not lay charges, that's correct, but they will take down the appropriate information so a charge can be laid. So I, I just think it's worthwhile for staff to make that contact and see what can be worked out. I don't think it's my role to do that. Madam Chair, I'm not going to dispute that. I, and no, staff are happy to meet with to the OPP person to the resolution. Absolutely. For sure. Um, Mayor Harding? Uh, thanks. I, I guess my only question or concern is a expensive police officer trained at X dollars. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we don't have enough police on the street. I, I understand in the past 30 days at times, there's only been one or two officers assigned to Muskoka Lakes because they're short-staffed. The, the staffing <laughs> dilemma is not, is not exclusive. It, it's one thing to say that, but it's not exclusive to uh, Tim Hortons and everybody else who can't find staff. Um, they're not doing any paid duty anymore because they are so short-staffed. Um, so I, I, my, my concern, if I go back to two months ago, we had some bylaw concerns. People didn't know how to complain. They didn't know how what to do. I think we have upped our website and made it far easier. Someone called me the other day, yesterday, as a matter of fact, said they had a fireworks complaint, went on the website. It was super easy. They did it. Complaint's been logged. Same thing. So if they can go do that by themselves, if they call our after-hours number, our after-hours dispatch is advising them to go to the website to formalize the complaint, to do the work, and our bylaw officer is doing it on Monday morning. The same process as the OPP would go if, if to Councillor Jagger's perspective and taking all the information down, but it's going to cost us a lot more money to have an OPP officer go out there and or divert time and energy away from what I'll call real policing. And um, I, again, I don't mind our staff having a conversation. I, I, I don't even know, think we need a resolution to have a conversation to understand, you know, as. Mr. Donald says, my neighbors are all making too much noise. They call the OPP. They come over. They get shut down. They're not laying charges, and we're not asking them to do a bunch of extra paperwork on our behalf. That complainant can follow the process that we have, and I think it's been working for the past month and a half. I don't know. That's my perspective. Yes, committee member. Uh, I would just appreciate an opportunity to, to respond to that. Uh, uh, Michael indicated that that, that, that was a, they're prepared to do that. There's no additional charge. We're paying for it now. Uh, he also, I reviewed, the, uh, he explained their operation. They have three shifts of officers. There are six officers on duty at every time. There's about eight or nine in each shift to cover holidays and so on. So he does, he does have sufficient forces. And he did admit that if there's, it's a triage thing, sure, if there's uh, many very difficult things going on, this may not get, uh, looked at but I, I think it's a worthwhile conversation I really do and and it was meant it's not meant for instead of our bylaw officer it's meant when the bylaw officer is not available which is weekends and holidays and everything else okay so I guess we can oh sorry yes. sorry thank you I guess to, a little bit to follow that because 
along with our conversation and discussion about the bylaw officer and, and the needs and all of that sort of thing, and we we talked about um, bylaw on the weekends. I don't think we've, I don't recall having a, a, a good conversation about bylaw during the week and actually having sort of somebody out there looking at our trouble spots that are happening on a regular basis. Why I say this is because I just got today two more emails on top of a few uh, that I've received last weekend, but today's Friday, so we've got, you know, we, we always talk about Don's Bakery and, and it being such a challenge. And so um, now, you know, I, it's, it's Monday and, um, and these came in at lunchtime, but the, the challenges are there and it's, it's pretty hard to, for a citizen to run to the phone, get by law, to run out to wherever location it is, but is there a way to be on the ground, like for instance, uh, the bylaw officer being at the bank in Port Carling, or, or as we know that um, uh, Don's Bakery in Portage Street, we talked about those trouble spots, and, and just seeing the presence of, of a bylaw officer during the week on some of those trouble spots could be helpful, I would suggest. Okay, so do we actually need to bring this back to committee for that? Well, so, Mayor Hart? so I, I, I hear it's totally something different because what you're saying, and I, I agree at times that our bylaw officer could be in front of Don's Bakery for parking at 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, but we're not, are we going to pay the police or expect the police to go by and say, by the way, move your car? I, I don't believe that's an effective use of a trained police officer. And, and the original question or concern, if I go back to two months ago, and I'm just I'm, I'm trying to follow, trying to figure out what we're really trying to achieve here, is that if there was a, an emergency call or something happened at night and there were, our bylaw officer's not gonna go out alone because there's too much partying going on or whatever, that's in place to call the police today. And the police are gonna go out today. So I don't know what else we need to do beyond that. I think that's what Mr. Burton might be saying, is that process is there. We, we are, and when people's life are in danger, but are, are we issuing parking tickets or are we doing, um, you know, you've got a messy front yard. I, it, it's a hard definition as soon as you tell the public, oh, you can also just call the police and they'll be your bylaw officer. And, and then they're, are they dialing the police or are they dialing 911? No, I don't think that's where we're going with, with I, I, I don't know the definition. Well, I don't know when to call the police or when to call bylaw. Well, that's the purpose for staff to meet with the, with the constable or the person in charge to set up that protocol when it's appropriate and not. And if you say it's happening now, when did, it, when, did, when did it last happen that the OPP attended and submitted the information that our bylaw officer could lay charges? Is that actually? It's happened this year. Pardon? It's happened this year. Okay. And they did actually provide an information sheet. Then, then, then it's done. So let's get it on our then, website. Then it's informational now. So um, can we leave that? Derek is working along with us on an information sheet that's going on the web page. We could add something to that. Yeah, just the clarity for that would be yes, yes. So that we can disseminate disseminate properly things like noise not things like cleaning up your yard. I mean, I agree. You, you, you want to limit that. Neil?
So, Neil, has have we had more people submit? I mean, is the website working? That the website is working. Actually. Great. Working great, great. Everybody gets everybody to do that. Everything's modern. We have good yeah. status on it. Yeah. We know yeah. where the problems are. We're right. dealing with any of the noise violations that have taken place in the evenings. We've dealt with them. Yeah. So we just have to keep making sure that everybody understands they have it has to be written in writing to you. Okay. All right. Um, just, just. Um, perhaps you could do that, unless everybody's interested. Perhaps you could have that conversation afterwards. It's three o'clock. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, Committee member. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess very specifically back to uh, Councillor Jaglowitz's uh, very specific reference to the OPP. I, I do think that I would be certainly supportive of the commentary to staff that that we would have uh, we as a township would have one more collaborative discussion with them about perhaps what is on that song sheet. What does the officer say to our constituents when they come into our township representing? us uh, as it relates to well I, I'm not here to enforce your bylaws but I'm here and, and I've been involved in those discussions with the police whether it's at wherever it is and and it's very frustrating as a constituent because now the police are here oh you know the police are here well they're not going to do anything when they're here and the point is it's what they say you know you've got a police presence uh, and then they don't do anything or, or they do what you're saying. I'm not talking about bylaws. I'm talking more specifically of some sort of event where the police have been called. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but you, you know, I, I would think it's very important that, oh, we're in the township of Muskoka Lakes, pull out this piece of paper, and this is what I tell them. Because I don't think that's, I, I don't for a fact it didn't happen the four or five times I was involved in it. And when you see the police there, you expect them to come out blazing and they're going to represent you and it's going to be great. That's not what happens. And I'm not sure if that's what yeah. Councilor Jaguars is saying, but I think, you know, just a meeting, get together, we all agree what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. I just leave this with you. Or do you want further clarification it, are staff supposed to then report back or what we're kind of the di direction is kind of not 100 percent solid <laughs> well I think we need the end result of the meeting I would like that yeah I, I would concur I think Derek can have a conversation with OPP and Neil and confirm where they support our bylaws how they don't support our bylaws and report back and let us all know and then basically help us all understand the system that's in place with them. Derek will take care of it. You'll do your best. Madam Chair, uh, thank you. I, I think it's important that staff do report back to this committee. This committee was raised the matter. It was uh, interested in it. So you can expect to report back. Thank you. Okay, um, well, we probably don't have any unfinished business because we haven't been here before. <laughs> but in terms of new business, uh, anybody have anything? Oh, well, I have something, and I'll be really brief. And I, I, I gather this is the section where we get to bring forward anything that we are concerned about. And my concern, which I spoke informally with Derek about when I met with him at lunch, is how we put in place protocols or procedures to stop building sites from becoming moonscapes and being completely, completely redesigned uh, when the owner comes in. Because we've had blasting that's taken sites down to the water line. We've had blasting that has completely, behind that 66-foot line, completely annihilated the whole landscape. So that's a real concern to me. Maybe I'm the only one here. But I would like to to see yeah, as a report back at some point, or does it go? It must be part of our new official plan. But is there something else in place that we can control that to a certain point? So that's my question. I don't know if anybody else has a comment or. So happy to chime in. Uh, 
Mr. Donald, myself, uh, a few months ago, had some discussions on blasting bylaw in particular, and uh, I think uh, at one point Mr. Donald could bring sort of some of that discussion report to where we're at with our current blasting bylaw, salt al site alteration bylaw, which I think covers off blasting. We allow so much. Um, and uh, can have some further discussion because it is of interest. I know Councillor Jagowitz has brought it up as well, um, of interest to uh, people as to how much blasting is appropriate, how much isn't. I think it really becomes site specific at the end of the day. Um, and I think, uh, Mr. Don, do you have an idea when a building permit's applied for generally what blasting is going to be required or not required? Not at all? It's the beginning. Oh, there we go. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, be, but our site alteration bylaw dictates. Yeah, beyond blasting, because for a footprint for something, it looks to me like the blasting is everywhere in some of these sites. If I may, uh, thank you. Um, so the planning department administers the site alteration bylaw, and it has it was passed in two thousand and eight. Uh, it is in need of a review. Uh, I'll be honest; our department just with an official plan review ongoing and the Minette. Uh, official plan amendment ongoing there's just and application numbers continue to go up and up there's just no ability for us to get to that right now uh, but it is on my my list um, and to give a, a brief rundown of it so new councillors are aware again it was passed in the summer of 2008 the same time same time as our uh, tree preservation bylaw and they work very similarly uh, and it, it was meant it was set up to be not an administrative burden so that not every property owner would have to come for a permit to blast or permit to cut down trees. And the way they were set up is they regulate all lands within 200 feet of any lake or river, any environmentally protected zoned areas, and our scenic corridors along our main highways. And essentially what it says is you're not going to alter grade in those areas or you're not going to cut down any trees and stop. It's quite simple and straightforward. Um, however, there had to in those bylaws be a number of exemptions and both are A through M, P, I forget. And they have a, a large list of matters where if you meet one of those exemptions, you do not have to come to the municipality for any type of approval. So since 2008, I can count on probably less than one hand how many applications for site alteration and tree removal we've had because we essentially tell everyone who comes in our office, don't bother, we're not going to approve it you either meet one of the requirements or we're not just going to let you cut down trees or blast a rockscape or fill in a wetland just because you feel like it. So no one's really applied. The issue that you might be having, it might to do with the exemptions, and that's something we could look at with an update to the bylaw. Um, but the main ones are if you obtain a building permit and you comply with the zoning bylaw, which means therefore you must conform with the official plan, you're entitled to remove that vegetation and you're entitled to remove rock or change grade in order to put that foundation in. And it's, as I think Neil was nodding in the previous question, there's really no ability for us to be aware, the owners aren't aware, when you get the building permit, until you start digging, how much rock you may have to remove. And I think the some of the more recent concerns, I'm aware of a property, I think we all probably are aware of it, uh, you know, that has been built I would say, uh, you know, to the extent of our bylaws with respect to uh, tennis courts, that's something I think our official plan should look at and zoning bylaw. You know, should we be allowing these large sport courts on every property within 66 feet of every lake and island? I, I think that's in serious need of looking at. Um, aerodromes, which is something we can't regulate, but I believe that's the matter there. And when you factor in driveways, parking areas, septic systems, large cottages, um, there can be extensive al alteration of property but it's fully compliant with our site alteration bylaw. And I think council needs to have, you know, have a serious discussion and consideration of you know, how much control you want uh, on that. Previous terms of council have had that discussion. There was debate about whether a permit system would be set up and there were significant concerns about uh, municipal liability and oversight of that sort of matter and, uh, and the administrative burden to set up that type of system. So there's pros and cons to the approaches. Uh, I wish I could bring it for you. I, to be honest, the site plan control bylaw is probably in more need of an update, and I'd like to get that to you first. Um, as I said, there's just unfortunately only so many hours in a day. We'll do our best to try to get these bylaws uh, updated in front of you uh, this term. Um, but two very large projects ongoing right now in our department that are really 
occupying a significant amount of my time. So, anyway, so hopefully that provides a bit of background on the two bylaws. Happy to answer any specific questions committee members have on them. Thank you, committee member Edwards. Since we're talking about blasting, uh, I had talked to uh, David about this. Um, Brent Quarries set off a charge on June the 4th that I seen a Facebook uh, on it. Somebody thought there was an earthquake and they were in Windermere, which is about five kilometers away from, from the pit. I've had two or three phone calls on it. And originally, I think when they got the pit, they were supposed to notify neighbors when they were blasting. And I believe uh, David said they had come back to, to uh, council and got that wave because he said it was a, a hazard because uh, and that people were uh, coming to look but I know and that there was a person across the road who was very upset about it and that because all of a sudden like you know, yeah that would be a bylaw enforcement yeah. matter well no and, and this is it if it happens but I mean there should be something some sort of a warning because like I say it sounded like it was a very large charge and there's no reason to, to be plastic like that. They can take it in sections rather than one large blast. But Mr. Pink? In response to that, the pits and quarries are, are regulated and licensed by and, and regulated and enforced by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. I believe the quarry in question, it was uh, before my time, but I believe in the late 90s, 2000s, when that uh, pit was licensed, it was actually under the Aggregate Resources Act, was under our purview and there was a requirement to notify neighbors when the blast would go off and after a number of years uh, the proponent of that quarry did approach the municipality and requested the council waive that requirement that it was actually a safety liability concern when people were being notified of the blast there would be a crowd uh, attending the quarry to, to watch uh, and they petitioned council and Cheryl hopefully can recall this as well I'm not dreaming I believe they came to council and requested that that requirement be waived and I believe council agreed so they're no longer required to notify other than what the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry protocol are so I think that's the history to uh, to that matter so if we make them notify everybody can we add that to the if we charge everybody five dollars to watch the blast can we add it to our uh, general funds <laughs> sorry Um, okay, so I guess we're really sort of what can we do about the blasting? It's it's the it's the elevation differences and stuff that I'm having trouble with. I, I think perhaps the best way to to leave that is again in in our department's hands. We will do our best to bring a review of the site alteration bylaw uh, back to this committee uh, in the future for a discussion and a review. Um, but to get you thinking that again, there, there's a number of exemptions. Um, where you are permitted to change grade, uh, which I think are appropriate, such as in the case of installing a septic system or constructing a, a building. Uh, and it, it will depend on really committee's desire, council's desire, how much regulation and administrative burden and enforcement you want to put to, to that piece. Um, it's very difficult. I find the tree preservation bylaw somewhat simpler. Our goal is to renaturalize properties. If people cut vegetation, we work with them and educate them and look to regenerate. When the rock gets blasted, the rock is gone, and there's really nothing staff can do to put it back, unfortunately. Um, you know, we can. We have run into a situation of filling of wetlands, and remarkably, they do bounce back quite well, and we have had property owners remove a filling of wetlands. But excessive blasting, as much enforcement as you want to put to it, when they pull the trigger, um, there's no way to put it back, and it's done. Um, so, and until they press the trigger, they haven't contravened anything. So it's extremely difficult to, uh, to police. I don't know how uh, uh, you prevent it. There, um, so some of the issues to, for this committee to start thinking about, and we'll bring, try our best to bring a report, uh, hopefully over the winter or next winter, um, to review that bylaw. Yes. Final comment on that. Um, the property that in question that I think both Barbara and I are talking about is the one on 123 River Riverdale Road. And um, I think we inquired that, the, that it was subject to site plan control. And uh, certainly, if there's a site plan, that should be able to regulate the blasting. So I, I just wonder if it wouldn't be helpful just to review that property and see how that was handled and whether maybe we can learn of how we should have handled that better in the future. I don't know if 
if it's appropriate, and it should probably read here as mine. To, I, to I would just say that, like, there's property, many bylaw um, matters that are kind of being discussed right now that shouldn't be discussed at a, a meeting. That you should address these directly with staff because people have the right to privacy. So I would, uh, that's what I will say that. Thanks. All right. Without further ado, then, moved by, this must be Frank again, moved by Committee Member Jaglowitz, seconded by Committee Member Roberts. Yeah, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, Councillor Roberts. Oh, that now I say Councillor Roberts, not Committee Member. All right. Yeah. Be it resolved that this meeting adjourn at 3.12 p.m. Wish it was a... No, I don't. Um, and the next regular meeting of the Planning Committee be held on Friday, August 16th, 2019 at 9 a.m. in the Council Chambers, Municipal Office, Port Carling, Ontario. A special meeting of the Planning Committee may be held on Friday, July 19th, 2019 at 1 p.m. at the Milford Bay Community Centre, Milford Bay, Ontario, for the purpose of an official plan community visioning session. All those in favour? Opposed? Carrie. Did, well, no, there what? wasn't, did people raise their hands? Like, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. 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 Just checking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It was a long day. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay. Because I was blocked here by this. And I was like, yeah.